Hello, everyone, and welcome to the strange details of standard string at Facebook. Uh, now, Nicholas, you might ask, what could possibly be strange about standard strings? And if you'd asked me that question four years ago, I wouldn't have had an answer for you. But now, now I have some answers. Answers to questions like, how are strings implemented? Why does GCC have a 25-byte null array in most programs? And what goes wrong when you are trying to make strings faster? The thing is, though, that these questions here are not why I am here today. Sure, these questions are what I'm here to answer. But it's not why this talk exists. This talk exists because I am missing the answer to some questions. Specifically, the question that I most want to have an answer to. Which string is the most efficient string at Facebook? Which string is the most efficient string for you? I don't have that answer. I do know a couple of things, though. And the first most important thing is that strings are important. If you look at Facebook code, Facebook code includes strings left, right, and center. I went on to GitHub, I cloned a whole bunch of trending C++ projects, and they all use strings left, right, and center too. Hello World is a strange program, because Hello World includes IO stream, but does not include string. Because string is a very large part of the standard library. It's a very core abstraction that everybody uses. And indeed, if you look at the CPU cycles spent inside of Facebook's infrastructure, of the time spent in namespace standard, 18% of it is spent inside of string. Inside of string, we have an opportunity for impact. But before we can figure out how to make strings better, we first need to understand how they work. And so isn't, isn't this how you implement a string? Isn't string just a size, capacity, char star, triple? Who thinks that this is a good string representation? No one? OK, a few people. There we go. See, I used to think that this is how strings worked. Four years ago, before I knew anything about strings, like, yep, strings internally, size, capacity, data, makes a lot of sense. And I thought this was true. I was happy. <laughs> and then I took the size of a standard string. And the size of a standard string in GCC4 is, is 8. The size of a standard string in GCC4 just barely fits a pointer. OK, so, so what's the representation then? How on earth does a GCC string keep track of its data, its size, how much of the space on the heap that it has allocated belongs to it? And the answer is that in GCC, a string is indeed a pointer to the heap, and the heap data is prefixed with the size and the capacity. All right. Is this all there is to standard strings? Turns out GCC has done two pretty nifty optimizations. And the first optimization stems from the observation that there is one string, one string that is much more common and popular than every other string. And that particularly common string is the empty string. Every time you default construct a string, every time you move a string, you have an empty string. The thing about the empty string, though, is it's not actually empty. Its heap size is one byte. It must have a null terminator, because C++ strings, like their C predecessors, must be null terminated. And so here's a question. Do you really want to be mallocking with 20, sec 20 nanosecond overhead, one byte on the heap every time you default construct a string? No. And GCC doesn't want to do this either. So they have an optimization. They have a global variable, which is the empty string. And every single empty string in your code points to this 25 byte array of zeros. A quick question that comes to mind, why have a global as opposed to having the representation null. Why not have null represent the empty string? And if you have null represent the empty string, then all of a sudden, all of your string code has a branch in it. When you take string.size, you have to check, hey, am I a null string? And if I am, the size is 0. 
Otherwise, if I'm not a null string, then please actually go to the heap to find the size. GCC does not want to have conditionals in the string code, which is why there is a particularly hot 25 byte array in your program. Uh, one other advantage of that 25 bytes, it is very good for your memory fragmentation. Collects all of the null strings together in one memory location. Uh, the second cool optimization that GCC strings do is an old trick called copy on write semantics. Copy on write semantics were outlawed in C11 for concurrency reasons, but the basic premise of copy on write is when you call the copy constructor of a string, just take a pointer to the original string's data. Have a ref count, which we see here preceding the data, that indicates, like a shared pointer, how many people are referencing the data. And when you want to modify the string, actually then perform the mem copy. Cool detail about their ref count. In GCC, they don't store the actual ref count. They store the ref count minus one, which means that the default state having one pointer is where your ref count value is zero. And that allows a very nifty trick, which is when your program is zero loaded or is loaded into zero initialized memory at boot time, the empty string does not require any additional processing before it's in a valid state. So this is GCC string prior to version five. And six years ago, this is the version of string that Facebook was using. Facebook was using GCC 4.6 with glibc 213, and this was the string to beat. And there was one guy who was like, hey, I can make a better string implementation. And that man was Andre Alexandrescu. <laughs> He's pretty cool. <laughs> and he, he, he observed that there's lots of Facebook programs that are bottlenecked on string code. Sometimes it's the malloc, sometimes it's the hopping around all these different pages to access your string data, but strings are slow. And we at Facebook, we with GCC strings, we're not making a classic optimization, which is the small string optimization. The premise of the small string optimization is we want to avoid as many malocs as possible. We want to avoid having data in random locations on the heap by storing string data, if it's small enough, on the stack. You still have to be able to store large strings with a data pointer. And so the basic implement or the basic representation of an FB string is indeed a data size capacity triple. Note though that the size and capacity have been pulled up from the heap and into the stack. That way we have 24 contiguous bytes of space on the stack to play with. Then, if, as in this case, the string is small, we will collapse the string into the stack. We'll have an alternate representation, a union, in which we store the string data not on the heap, but in the structure on the stack. So here we have a 24 byte structure. Here's a question. How many bytes of string data can we store in a 24 byte structure? If it was up to me to implement FB string six years ago, the answer would have been 22. Here's how I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna have 22 bytes of user data, I'm gonna have a null pointer, and I've got one byte left over in which I can store the capacity or the size of the in situ string, as well as store a single flag bit so that I can identify whether or not I'm in a normal string or a small string. If I was doing it, it would have been 22 bytes. But I wasn't doing it. Andre Alexandrescu was doing it. And Andre had a different plan. You see there in the small string representation, there's a nine at the end. What is that? Because the size of that string is not nine. The size of that string is 14. Nine is the amount of spare capacity in the string. Nine is the amount of extra characters that we can push into the stack before it becomes full. And the magic about spare capacity is that when the spare capacity is zero, i.e. your string is chock full to capacity, zero, is also the null terminator. Your spare capacity, <laughs> conveniently placed at the end of the string, does double duty as a null terminator, allowing you to shove 23 bytes of in situ capacity. As you push characters back into the string, the null terminator converges to the right, 
and the capacity drops down to zero, both of them meeting at the 24th byte, storing 23 bytes in situ. Uh, Andre is very clever. So I said there's a, there's a flag bit somewhere. We have to be able to differentiate between are we a small string, are we a normal string, and where does that flag bit go? I mean, if you look at that small string, it's, there's 23 bytes of user-defined data that we really can't touch, and then we've got eight zero bits. Where's the flag bit gonna go? Well, conveniently, flag bits can be zero, so no matter what the flag bit situation is, we're gonna have to put the flag bits in the 24th byte, and flag bytes of zero must indicate that you have a small string. Now, the spare capacity, because it ranges from zero to 23, takes five bits, means we have three bits left over to be our flag. So we've got some space inside of small string for some flag variables. If we look at the normal string, we also don't immediately seem to have a lot of space to play with flag bits. Uh, for those of you who were at Chandler's talk this morning, Chandler liked to say that, hey, I'm gonna use the lower bits of the data pointer because malloc's always gonna return to me pointers that are 16 byte aligned. But Andre had a different plan. <laughs> and this goes to JE malloc, which is Facebook's malloc implementation. JE malloc, like most malloc implementations, works with buckets, which means that if you ask for 29 bytes, for example, JE malloc will internally round that up to a convenient size, in this case 32, and it will then go off into a bucket full of 32 byte memory chunks and return one as the result to malloc 29. FB string knows about this trick. FB string knows that JE malloc will secretly return data that might have some extra space left over. And so Andre put an extra optimization in, a check to see whether or not we could secretly increase the capacity we requested from malloc without actually requesting different memory. This way, FB string's got a little bit of extra data to play with, doesn't waste memory on the heap. Oh, and by the way, as a side effect, all of JE malloc's buckets are multiples of eight. Therefore, you are guaranteed to have three spare bits at the bottom of capacity. And that is where, that is where FB string stores our flag bits at the bottom of capacity inside of the normal string representation. There is a third mode, by the way, to FB string, which is copy on write semantics. For strings that are larger or greater than or equal to 255 bytes long, there is a, small, a large string optimization. We stick a ref count on the data on the heap, and we use one of the extra flag bits inside of capacity to say, hey, we've got a large string. If you guys wanna learn more, about large string. If you guys want to learn more about FB string and JE malloc, Andre Alexandrescu did a talk covering all the stuff I cover in this slide and a hell of a lot more. His talk is available. It's called Sheer Folly, Folly being Facebook's open source library in which FB string is published and on which Dave Watson will be giving a talk tomorrow. Anyways, if you want to learn more about small strings and FB strings, Andre Alexandrescu, Sheer Folly, there's a talk. One more thing I'll mention about this is Clang has a very, very similar implementation of string. They also have a 24 byte structure. They store 22 bytes of in situ capacity, but they don't rely on the fact that malloc will always return num uh, pointers that have some zeros at the bottom. And specifically, they are going to place the flag bit in a different location. And the trick that they use is that most standard containers, in fact all standard containers, have a max size variable, a max size function. Standard containers can specify, hey, you're not allowed to grow beyond a given size. And Clang has reasoned that no one needs a string of size two to the 64. So they have arbitrarily decided that strings may not exceed size two to the 63, leaving them one spare bit in both capacity and size. That's how Clang does things. Okay. Back to FB string, we have this cool string, Andre Alexandrescu made it six years ago in 2010. How does it compare? How does it stack up to GCC's implementation of string? And the answer, if you look at the assembly code, is pretty bad. This does not look promising. Here is the assembly code for string.size, for both GCC strings and FB string. In string.size, it's just two instructions. FB string, 
has lots of instructions, and it starts with a conditional. It starts almost every single FB string function first has to check which representation it is. Are you a small string? Because if so, I have to work one way. And if you're not a small string, then I have to interpret the data in a totally different fashion. And this branching in your assembly code is the exact thing that GCC tried not to do. I did not show, there we go. That is the code. That is the code right there that occurs in every single string function. So what do the benchmarks have to say? And the benchmarks are confusing. When I first saw that, I ran these numbers and I just stared at it and I had no clue what was going on. How on earth can those nine lines of assembly code, including a branch, be faster than GCC's quick to assembly instructions? And the answer all boils down to the memory layout of your program. You see, GCC stores its data always on the heap, and also the size is on the heap. And so every time you call string.size, every time you call string.data, you have to go to likely a different page in memory, load a new page. And that's the real thing that's slowing strings down. I confer two quick tests confirm. I ran this benchmark, by the way, over 100,000 strings, where you do actually see the effect of page misses. If I change the benchmark instead to run, 64, or to run over 64 strings in quick succession, then GCC's benchmark, because all of the data fits in my working set, drops from 1.6 nanoseconds down to 0.3 nanoseconds. It's much faster. The other quick test is if I run perf, I see that for 100,000 strings, GCC has L1 cache misses that are three times higher than FB strings. So we're in a bit of a conundrum right now. We're looking at FB strings benchmarks and it's like, hey, the assembly code is clearly worse, but at the same time, the memory layout is better. What, what wins? And the only way to find out what wins is to replace standard string with FB string, which we did four years ago in 2012. One day, you included string and size of standard string was eight. The next day, you included string and size of string is 24. And then we went to our website team. We're like, hey guys, can you run the website, figure out what the numbers are, what the performance implications are with this new implementation? And our team went and they ran www.facebook.com with FB strings replacing standard strings. And the answer that we got at the end of the day was a 1% performance win. I don't know if you're laughing because that's a good number or a bad number. It sounds small. Bjarna yesterday was talking about, hey, I really want my 10x improvements. It, spoiler alert, you're not going to get a 10x improvement by replacing string. But this 1% is 1% across all of Facebook. This 1% doesn't just apply to the compiler. This 1% applies to every single C++ program that Facebook runs. This is really, really good for us. I'll let you in on a secret. This is how Facebook works. Facebook has these leaps where we, hey, we make things five times better, 10 times better. But in between leaps, we have a whole bunch of little 1% wins that compound over time to make all services more efficient. And this is one of them. This is a really good one. Really good, and we have kept it. We have continued to dedicate engineering effort to maintaining FB string inside of lib standard C++. So we have, we have replaced standard string with FB string. Now that we own the string, yeah, what other cool things can we do? And I think the coolest thing that we tried to do is we tried to kill the null terminator. Who here, who here, if they could snap their fingers, would get rid of the null terminator in C++? There's no bugs. Would you? There we go, most people. See, I personally despise the null terminator. It's not something C++ programs should rely on. C++ standard strings are allowed to contain intermediate null terminators. If you are relying on searching for a null terminator to figure out how big your string is, your code has a bug in it. Also, FB string had this cool optimization where, hey, we'd lazily write the null terminator. When people are saying, hey, push back elements into my string or possibly append a bunch of strings together, yeah, we'll lazily write that null terminator because people should not be depending on it. We even had a mode 
where we would explicitly write a bogus null terminator to make sure that people's code was actually crashing instead of possibly silently succeeding. Of course, Seaster and Data did have to append a null terminator because those calls do interoperate with libraries that expect C strings. So technically, by the way, this is illegal. This actually is not something that is technically allowed by the standard. Much like copy on write, which was disallowed in C++11, having this writing of a null terminator is not something you really want to do from a concurrency perspective. But we did it anyways, and it works. And the reason it works in practice is because most people write good code. Most people write code that don't rely on the null terminator, and in the odd case where they do, we own the entire stack so we can go and we can fix the code. So I'm kind of, uh, I'm on the fence as to whether or not I like the fact that we still have copy on write strings. But we do still have copy on write strings. They haven't broken irreparably for us. But we don't have the dead null terminator anymore. We lost that fight. And you know what killed us? One const. You see, cster is a const function. And the standard specifies that cster shall not modify the data in any way, and with good reason. Our search team came to us one day and they said, hey, build team, our code is slow. And we found out why. You see, we have a global read-only string variable. And we've got lots of individual threads that are reading from this global string and calling cster on it. And from the programmer's perspective, cster is definitely const. They just call cster and they get their null terminated strings. But from the CPU perspective, this function is definitely not const. Every time any thread calls cster, a null terminator is appended to the back of the string, which trashes the cache line on all the cores. This was terrible, absolutely terrible for the performance of our search code. Fortunately, we've got some smart people on the search team. And so they said, hey, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna see if someone's beaten us to the punch. We're gonna see if some other thread has already called Seaster, see if the null terminator exists. And only if it doesn't exist do we have to write it. I like this diff, by the way. I approved this diff. I waited for the test to pass first, but then I approved it. <laughs> and I was happy. All was good in the world because we no longer had this problem where we couldn't write the null terminator. And I say all was good until Mark Williams came and commented on the diff. This diff is broken. Mark Williams, by the way, is one of these characters who will just occasionally swoop in and fix some ludicrously difficult problem that you didn't even know you had. This diff has undefined behavior. This diff potentially reads from uninitialized memory. Here's the setup. Mark Williams on his build server runs a compiler that must maintain a list of file names taken from the operating system. Those file names, if one of them happens to be 128 bytes long, the string containing it will need to allocate at least 129 bytes of memory, plus one for the null terminator. J.E. malloc rounds 129 up to 192. What's the magic of 192? 128 is a multiple of the GCD between 192 and 4096, which is the page size. What does that mean? That little bit of gobbledygook math means that if you want a string that is 128 bytes long, malloc might return you an address that is precisely 128 bytes away from the end of a page. So if you happen to allocate a string that's 128 bytes and malloc happens to return to you a memory address that's 128 bytes away from the end of a page, you will write the 128 bytes and the null terminator will be the first byte on the next page. Now, before you call cster, what you really need to have happen is have malloc allocate memory on that second page, free it, and then conditionally return it to the kernel. Now call cster. If you call cster when the page has been conditionally returned to the kernel, the kernel is like, hey, you're reading from uninitialized memory. I can do whatever I want. I'm gonna return zero. 
the null terminator. So no null terminator is actually written when you call Seaster. However, if next you actually perform a real write to that second page, the kernel will realize that you want the actual page back and it will return to you the original page with the original data, which may not contain a null terminator as the first byte. If you then do not call Seaster again, you will have a non-null terminated string floating around in your program, causing it to crash. If that was hard to follow, press pause, rewind the YouTube video that you are currently watching, <laughs> press play, and watch it all again. And when it still makes absolutely no sense, just stand in awe at the fact that there were five stars that had to align to cause this bug, and Mark Williams found it. I have absolutely no clue how that man found that bug. If this bug had been dropped at my doorstep, I would have just kind of stared at it and been hopelessly, hopelessly lost. So this bug was about uh, two years ago. It's the most complicated bug I've ever seen inside of any piece of code, really, but FB string certainly. So that was two years ago. What about today? What, is, what, what has changed between four years ago and today? C++ 14, but that's actually not the thing that's caused me to give this talk. See, the thing that caused me to give this talk in the first place, the thing that kicked off all of these changes, is that GCC has a new string representation. GCC 5 has a new string layout. And I don't know whether or not the new string layout is better than FB string anymore. We've had this 1% performance optimization for four years, and it needs to be reevaluated. So, how do GCC, uh, new GCC strings work, by the way? Well, first thing is, they're C++11 compliant. They've dropped the copy on write trick, and they have adopted the small string optimization. For the small string, so of course they have now a larger stack capacity. They've got data size capacity. Excuse me, they also have eight bytes of unused space at the end of their stack. If there is a small string, they will multi-purpose capacity, as well as the eight unused bytes at the end, to, source, to store some data in situ. How does this compare to FB string? The first thing is, these GCC strings have the small string optimization. The big win that we got from FB string four years ago is we had small string optimization. GCC now has that. Another interesting thing is that data and size both have the same representation in both formats of GCC strings. This means that there's no conditional branching going on inside of data calls or size calls, which means the assembly code is much nicer looking and much faster. Also, the size of standard strings is 32, which quite conveniently fits two of them into one 64-byte cache line. This isn't to say, though, that new GCC strings are strictly better than FB strings. The big downside is there's only 15 bytes of in-situ capacity. And it happens to be that one of Facebook's favorite things to put in strings is base 10 serialized 64-bit random numbers. And 64-bit UIDs serialized in base 10 takes up 20 bytes, which an FB string is allocated on the stack, but with these new GCC strings, gets pushed off to the heap. Another thing, and this is a little bit of a smaller thing, a move is no longer a mem copy. If you look at vectors, and you look at vector instantiations, the most common vectors are vectors of ints, vectors of strings, and vectors of other vectors. And it happens to be that for these three very common vector types, when you do a resize, instead of doing a move and a destroy, you can just do a bit copy. Don't bother with the move constructor. Don't bother calling destructors on the original data. Just do bit copies. And that optimization is broken with new strings. Lastly, the size is eight bytes larger than an FB string. And this 33 increase in the stack size of a string does affect the memory layout inside your program. So a couple of bits of pieces of data. Uh, I'm not really worried about the move. The move thing isn't great, but move is called one or two orders of magnitude less frequently than string.size is called. So the wins in size should definitely compensate for the, win, for the losses in move. The big thing that I'm worried about is the reduction in size. We're losing eight bytes of in situ capacity and I don't know what the performance implication of that will be inside of Facebook because strings in the range size 16 to 23 is a double digit percentage of all strings greater than 16 bytes. 
And so we're going to run an experiment. We're currently in the middle of running an experiment to figure out if we're going to continue to use GCC strings. Because it is indeed a fair bit of engineering effort to maintain our own custom implementation of the string. So those are strings. Those are a few implementations of strings uh, that GCC, that Clang, and that Facebook uses. Uh, by the way, Microsoft's version is very similar to GCC's new strings. The thing about strings, though, is it's not a solved problem. Four years ago, I thought, hey, you know, strings are a size, a capacity, and a char star pointer, and that's it. But that's not the case. Strings are still changing, as evidenced by the fact that GCC just got a shiny new SSO optimized string implementation. And the thing about these string implementations is, yes, it's important to have good optimized assembly code, but it is also very important to understand how the memory layout of your code is affected by the data layout of a string. And the only real way to test this, the only way for me to know which string is the best string for Facebook, and the only way for you to know which string is best for you is to run some tests on some real world data. My name is Nicholas. It's been a pleasure giving a talk to you today, and I'll be around for questions. Thank you. <laughs>